Das Mikro ist an, würde ich mal schätzen. Okay, the microphone ähm, switched on, I guess. I was not in the jihad and I don't want to join the jihad. But my patella is injured. This is why I cannot stand up. And for our dialogue, because this will not be a lecture, it will be a dialogue and unfortunately I have to sit down. Well, I could talk only about the jihad propaganda. Umberto Eco died yesterday, and there are semiological analysis of jihadist propaganda. That would be very abstract, very boring. I'd prefer to talk about this in more concrete terms. What is jihadism? What is jihad? And how does this propaganda work? But first of all, I have a question to you. What is jihad? Who is courageous enough to answer the question? I think you have microphones. And what is jihadism? We have microphones. Who is courageous enough to do so? Otherwise, I have to volunteer somebody. I can do that as well. Heiliger Krieg, okay. Holy war, okay. Holy war. Well, you didn't need a microphone, okay. Okay. What is jihadism? bitte. Pardon? Das extreme vom Jihad. Also das extreme. The extreme part of jihad. So the extreme of the holy war. Das waren wirklich wieder meine Lieblings super Antworten. Well, my favorite answers. I hear them very often. All wrong. And this is a true problem. We talk about things we are affected by. We talk about Europe. We talk about the southern Mediterranean. We are all closely linked. We talk about refugees, about terrorism and jihad. But nobody really knows what jihad is or what even jihadism is. And this causes a lot of problems because French philosopher Camus once said, if we don't name names and can describe what we are talking about, we will contribute to disasters in the world. Well, jihad cannot be translated as holy war, even though the press often does so. Jihad comes from the Arab, it comes from the root of a verb, it means to make the biggest effort. Jihad, classically speaking, in a Muslim legal world, is defined. There is the big jihad. This is the inner effort to become a better Muslim, a better individual. And there's the small jihad, which is clearly defined as well. It is a clearly ruled defensive war. Jihadism as such is quite a new phenomenon, but let me go back first. Very often we talk about Islamist terror. I do not really like it because what is Islamism? Islamism is extremely broad, an enormous field of people who think that Islam should play a part in politics and society. Ranges from Erdogan's Turkey towards Muslim social organizations up to the most extreme form jihadism. So Islamism in the context of terror is not the right word to use. What is jihadism? Well, Islamism, by the way, is a word that European social scientists created. It didn't really exist. They defined it this way in order to describe a certain range of a political and social scope. What is jihadism? Jihadism is not an Arab word, as I just said. It was created by social scientists in order to describe a phenomenon. There is a Muslim trend in Islamism, which I think doesn't have a lot to do with the Islam, which reinterpreted jihad. We contribute to this. Do you have an idea when jihadism came about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Er vermutet während des Ersten Weltkrieges. Well, he, he thinks during the First World War. Can we have a second opinion? Ja, das sagen ja natürlich die Karlsruher. Ne? Well, this is what the people of Karlsruhe say, of course. Also wir nähern uns an. Also damals gab es... Okay, we are coming closer. Ah ja, okay. Okay, alles klar, mache ich. Ähm, ähm, wer die Taliban... Also Taliban... Taliban. Ähm, die Taliban während des Kampfes gegen die Russen... Taliban during the fight against the Russians in Afghanistan and before this we heard the First World War and if not that it was under Napoleon. These were the three answers. I think there is a fourth alternative. I think in the 1930s. Does it have to do with the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt? No, not really. We have some originators. Well, jihadism was created with our active support during the war against the Soviet Union in the 1980s. At the time, we didn't have the Taliban that only came about 10 years later and so on. What happened? The West reaktionärsten, extremistischsten Elemente aus der afghanischen oder auch aus der Pick the most reactionist elements from Afghan society in order to copy a Vietnam situation for the Soviet Union. And the West didn't care how bad these guys were. The most important thing was to really do something against the Soviet Union. And this was a calculation that really worked in the end. Well, jihadism is also an ideology which had its thinkers. And we have proof of how the concept was developed. There was a Palestinian teaching in Saudi Arabia. And he reinterpreted the jihad as we described it before. The Palestinian Abdullah Azam said, jihad basically is only war, basically war. And for thousands of years, uh, what well, it did uh, topple thousands of years of uh, Muslim legal system. In the past, we had a situation where only a legitimate Palestinian ruler can call for jihad and only those who are directly attacked can defend themselves. Abdallah Musad said, no, this is wrong. Jihad is the sixth pillar of Islam. All Muslims in the world have to fight in the jihad. The idea behind this was to bring as many fighters as possible to Afghanistan in order to win over the Soviet Union. But this is a radical reinterpretation. And this individual also wrote, we will not be able to change the world by um, wise men who publish papers. There is nothing else but fight in order to defend the Arab world, for example, against the Israelis or how to topple unjust rulers. That's a reinterpretation. Abdallah Azam, what did he do next? What is a martyr in Islam? This is not a direct question. We talk about the kamikaze attack, the suicide attackers in Paris, or the suicide attacks in the Middle East, and the jihadists call them martyrs. As a matter of fact, in the Islam, there have never been any suicide attacks. The first in the world took place in another geographic region. The Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka. This is where the first suicide attacks in the 1960s took place. Nothing like this in the Islam. In the Islam, there's no concept of martyr and not at all in a way of suicide attack. The Arab word for martyr is called shahid, comes from the root of a verb which is called shahada, which means witnessing or confirming, confirming the belief. And again looking back, until today, witnesses in court are called shahid, so it's the same word as martyr, so it means witnessing something or confirming something. And in the Islam, Islamic history, 
Unlike in Christianity, there was no concept of suffering for giving this proof of uh, your belief, of your faith. This is to be found in Christianity, in the Catholic religion. This didn't exist in the Islamic religion, but the concept was reinterpreted also during the Afghanistan war against the Soviet Union, also by Abdullah Hassan. He said, sacrifice yourself in fight, dying in the fight, looking for your death in fight is the highest level of martyrdom. But it's a radical reinterpretation, so it's a very new phenomenon. Why did this individual do so? He had observed certain situations that ruled world history. Self-sacrifice is a form of asymmetric warfare. While fighting was going on in Afghanistan, there was a different bloody war that we forgot with hundreds of thousands of victims, the first Iran-Iraq war. Saddam Hussein invaded the Iran because he believed that the Iranian regime had been weakened because of the revolution. Saddam Hussein was extremely strong because of the weapon technology from the West, German weapons, French weapons, American fighter jets were supplied to him, and the Iranian army had been weakened by cleansing initiatives, by instability after Khomeini had come to power, and so on. Iranians had one advantage, and this was the demographic structure. They had 20 to 30 million more people, and the Ayatollahs and Sheets, maybe I can talk about them later on again. The jihadist terror is only a Sunni terror today, but that's a different matter. So these people, the Ayatollahs, or the Shiites then introduced the concept of suffering and modernized it, suffering for religion. I mean, they had betrayed their first uh, caliph and there are rituals as uh, punishing your, yourself in a Shiite ceremony, for example, and so everything was reinterpreted in a way that people said, so until death you have to fight against the Iraqis. Maybe some of you remember young Iranians who ran underneath uh, Iraqi tanks with the strange headgear they were wearing. They were the first to really implement this new cult. The Sunnis, however, who had to fight against the Soviets in Afghanistan, took up this idea with a certain thought in their mind. What thought was it? People who are willing to die are uh, very, very fearsome weapon in form of asymmetric warfare. At the time, we didn't hear of suicide attacks. People just died while fighting. Bin Laden, well, he is to be mentioned in the context of Al-Qaeda. The origin of Al-Qaeda, the concept of the Palestinian who reinterpreted martyrdom, reinterpreted it again. They didn't only say, you're the best Muslims if you actively die during fight. No, the best thing is to die while you commit suicide why you blast a bomb and it's not only 9-11 it's a red threat we still find today where every day we see suicide attacks in some parts of the world and in order to make sure that people really take part in this asymmetrical war Enormous propaganda was required. You cannot easily convince people, telling them, well, you have to blow yourselves up and then you will land in paradise. No, a propaganda war was required and it's still going on. In the jihadist propaganda, there is only one important thing. But let me ask a question first. Who of you has seen a jihadist propaganda movie? Or excerpts, probably every one of you. Okay, everybody. 
Also mich hat man in den letzten, in den letzten Monaten natürlich immer wieder In recent gefragt, months, I have been asked time and again when the horror images went around the world of decapitations and so on. And also the public media showed extensive excerpts. And I was asked, is it new? that they managed to produce trash propaganda products. No, it's not new. Since the war in Afghanistan, there are lots of movies, and it's interesting to see that people who do not accept images then produce bad videos. But these videos have been in existence for more than 30 years, and the main goal, the inner message of the movie, be it a modern one or not, is to say, first of all, join us, because we jihadists are the only true Muslims, the only true community of faith. This way you avoid to land in hell. It's the eschatology uh, that people try to convey. We are the only true Islamists, so join us. And secondly, they say, if you join us, and then blow yourselves up or die while fighting, you will be the best Muslims whatsoever because you will receive a VIP ticket to paradise and you don't have to wait for doomsday. So this is the core message we hear time and again. And that's the surprising thing and this brings me back to the basic topic of my brief presentation. So this message uh, that is trapping so many people in Western Europe consists of very simple truths, well, what is regarded as a truth. So this Louis Young French people, I unfortunately was only one hour away from where the second attack took place recently in France. But this promise that you will be saved in the end is, is uh, something really, really big. Um, and here European values come into play as well. Some young, young Europeans who very often feel excluded are taught simple values, join us. If you join us, you will be the only true Muslims, you will land in paradise and you have to blow yourselves up because then you will be the heroes. Unfortunately, it seems to work with some young people, but what do we do against this? Why don't we manage to convey our values? This is a problem I am dealing with in France at the moment, where we have an enormous problem where the French start to think about opportunities of preventing this from happening. But what I think about a lot is the relationship of Europe, and this relates to jihadism, with our southern Mediterranean neighbors. And this is my last question to you. What were the last images you saw from the southern Mediterranean neighboring countries? Refugee camps? And the, the Daesh, the pseudo-Islamic State Daesh, is an Arab abbreviation, which means the crusher. Well, it's better to call them Daesh instead of pseudo-Islamic State. And the propaganda videos. So what do we see from the southern Mediterranean destruction in Syria, some propaganda videos, and refugee dramas? It all belongs together. In other words, and this brings me back to jihadist propaganda, it will only take two minutes and ten seconds. Jihadists managed to influence our perception by the inflow of refugees and to monopolize it 
through the southern Mediterranean region because you don't see anything else. We don't see the young Egyptian artists who come up with great movies and uh, are really opposing their regime. We don't see any of the high culture of Syria and the Iraq any longer. We don't see that there is a fragile model of Tunisia being maintained there, which is very, very difficult because we are completely trapped, we as human beings and as the media. So the southern Mediterranean, our direct neighbors, are only perceived as a threat or as a zone of crisis, although many other things are happening there. And this is the second major aim of the dangerous jihadist propaganda and um, their actions to polarize, to polarize us and to polarize in a way that there are two different fronts between here and the southern Mediterranean neighbors. They came up with a threat scenario to further polarize our society and recruit even more people. Was this brief enough? So, thank you very much.